seven basic primary emotions. However, we also have secondary emotions. And these secondary emotions start to develop in our toddlerhood. Usually when we're around two to around four is when most of these emotions start to come online. We often call a lot of these secondary emotions these self-conscious emotions. And that's because they require us to be more complex and self-evaluative. They happen around age two because we have to have a sense of who we are. And although we're not covering the development of the self in this unit, it's important to know that we really don't have a sense of self until we're roughly age two. And so once you know who you are and who others are, you can become more aware of you and of others. We also find some of these secondary emotions are more context specific, and they don't tend to be more biologically based, but more situationally based. And so I like to cluster them into two categories. I like to think about other evaluative and self-evaluative. That is the emotions we feel when we judge others and the emotions we feel when we judge ourselves. So when we're judging others, we can judge each other in positive ways or in negative ways. And this requires a certain level of perspective taking. And so we have to think about what we feel about them. And some of these emotions require for us to take the perspective of other people. So because of that, these emotions tend to be a lot later to mature because we have to understand who we are, who they are, and wrap our minds around what they are experiencing. For instance, the emotion of empathy is the idea that when somebody is displaying an emotion, you feel the same emotion as them. And so you feel empathetic towards them. And so this is the idea that if somebody is crying and hurt, you will feel sad too. Compassion is a little bit different than empathy. It's not so much feeling the emotion the other person is feeling, but more so understanding their perspective and understanding their goals. Infants can show this really early on. If a parent gets hurt or if an adult is struggling to get something, an infant will try and understand what they're reaching for or what they need and will help them out. In controlled experimental studies with researchers, where the researcher would drop an object, the infant would help them pick it up, particularly when they saw the researcher struggle or they saw the researcher become upset. So this showed a little bit of empathy and a little bit of compassion in there. They could read what was going on with the adult and understand their goals and they decided to help them. So we can definitely see empathy and, and compassion pretty early on in the lifespan. That being said, our capacity for empathy and compassion continues to grow throughout the lifespan. And understanding how these things are different from pity or patronizing is something that continues to develop. Another type of positive evaluation is love. And love or infatuation or positive attachment is basically the idea that you think very highly of a person and you wish them the best and you want to see good things from them. And so this is the idea that we're judging someone in a positive way and we want to see good things happen and we feel very nice towards them. On the flip side of the thing, we can feel some other types of things towards people. We can feel envy. Now, envy is the emotion that you see something that somebody else has and you want it too. You don't necessarily want to take it away from them, but you want one too. And so this might be the idea that if somebody gets a candy, you don't necessarily want their candy, but you also want a candy. That's envy. If you go to someone's house and they got a new cool big screen TV, you don't really want to steal their TV, but you wish you had one too. That is envy. That's very different from jealousy in which you want to take their resources. So jealousy is if somebody else has a candy, you want to take the candy from them. We tend to feel more jealous when we feel there's a scarcity of resources. So let's say somebody got the last big screen TV that was on sale. You're jealous, not envious, because you wish you had the TV and they didn't. So envy is like you just wish there's enough to go around for you too, versus jealousy is you wish you could dominate over them and have the resources they have access to. We start to see envy and jealousy very early on in the lifespan. A classic example would be if children are playing with toys and there's enough toys for everyone to go around, but one child keeps taking the toys that a second child picks up, regardless of what they actually want to play with. As soon as child A picks up a blue block, child B wants it. So child A picks up a red block, now child B wants it. And that is showing a lot of jealousy and possessiveness. They want everything that other child's interested in. That type of behavior may also exist not for jealousy, but just of interest. As child A picks up a toy, it captivates child B's attention, and their attention is drawn to that. So a very highly distractible infant may also show that type of behavior, but wouldn't have the same emotional and jealous response. We can also see a strong jealousy response when a child sees their caregiver paying attention to another child especially if they're a younger or only child and their mom or dad are hanging out and maybe holding a baby nephew or a baby niece and they've never seen that before, they might become right close, they might cuddle into their parent and almost try and push the baby out of the way. So we tend to see jealousy like that very early on in the lifespan. 
And finally, for this slide, we need to talk about the emotion of hate. How we're defining hate for this course is basically the dehumanization of another individual. A strong dislike for someone to the point you dehumanize them and you say that they are not equal to you. So this is the idea you say names that make someone not sound human. You call someone a monster or you call someone a demon or you call someone evil in a way that takes away their humanity and that makes you prepared to be content with really acts of atrocity against them. And it's the idea that if you frame them in your mind that they are dogs or they are not humans, they're below you, this prepares you to be tolerant to acts of hate against them. So hate is really the dehumanizing such dislike to the point you dehumanize another group or an individual in particular. So with these other evaluative emotions, we can also experience self-evaluative emotions. And of course, to evaluate yourself, you have to have a good sense of yourself. And so we start to see these again in the toddler and preschool years once we have a good sense of self. And so we can have positive evaluations of ourselves, such as like pride. Pride is an emotion we feel when we succeed or when we feel good about ourselves. And so it's the idea of, hmm, I'm proud of who I am. And there is a facial expression tied to pride, even though it's not a primary emotion. And it's a kind of a little smirk. Our nose does actually go up, our chin goes up, hmm. And so it's this little, little, little we almost all look to the side and say, yeah, okay, I'm proud of myself. And so we hold our head a little bit up higher when we're feeling prideful. We also have the emotion of triumph. And triumph is really fascinating. We tend to throw our hands in the air when we are feeling triumphant. Infants who have never seen this before also tend to throw their hands in the air. It might have been biologically hardwired into us if you think back to the Neanderthal ages and we were warfaring tribes. And the idea is when you won at something, you might put your hands in the air as a way of dominating or, or really cheering yourself on. But we tend to see babies do this. When they win something dramatic, they say, yay, I did it, I did it. And they will be very happy and show uh, that act of triumph. We also have ways we may evaluate ourselves in a more negative way or in a more self-conscious way. And they can be often used interchangeably in non-scientific language. But for the purpose of this course, we're going to define them each uniquely. And so we have the feeling of guilt. So guilt is usually when you negatively evaluate one of your voluntary behaviors. So if you voluntarily chose not to call someone back, or you voluntarily chose not to scoop your dog's poop when you're out walking them in a public place, or you voluntarily chose to take the last of the desserts in the fridge. So that's when you feel guilty about something. It's a voluntary behavior that you feel negative about. This is compared to shame. Shame is when you feel negative about yourself as a person rather than just as an individual behavior. So you might feel guilty that you went out and smoked a cigarette, but you feel ashamed to be a smoker. You might feel guilty that you didn't call someone back, but you feel shamed that you're not good at holding up relationships. You might feel guilty that you eat less food in the fridge, but you're ashamed that you're a glutton. And so shame tends to be more global, more general, more permanent than guilt and tends to be a little bit more intense. These are both different from embarrassment. Embarrassment is the idea that something about yourself, something that you can't control or something that's involuntary has been exposed to others. And you're embarrassed that that part of yourself has been exposed. So this might be that you're embarrassed your parents told a story about you being potty trained as a toddler. You shouldn't feel guilt or shame about that. That's not something voluntarily you did and you're now potty trained, but they might tell this cute story about when they were potty training you when you were little and you don't want that to come up with mixed company or you feel embarrassed that you farted or that you have spinach in your teeth and it's more involuntary. So embarrassment is more a part of you gets exposed that you don't want to be exposed. Now certainly in everyday life, you can feel guilt, shame and embarrassment about the same sort of idea. So let's say you're a smoker and you don't want people to know and you're embarrassed they find that out about you. You might feel embarrassed and ashamed at the same time. So it's possible to feel combinations of these secondary emotions. Now talking about these self-evaluative emotions gets us right lined up to talk about our next topic of self-esteem.